Hello, everyone. This is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for July 17th, 2023. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Paul Cutler, and I'm a member of the CircuitPython community. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, please consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafruit.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add it to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you would like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There is a notes document that accompanies the meeting and recording. The final notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video, so you, you, you can use the doc to skip around and view the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 45 to 60 minutes. After each meeting, we post a link for the next week's notes documents in the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest doc, notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. This meeting will be held in five parts. The first part is community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a chosen set of items from our Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, libraries, and Blinka. This is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from our status updates. The third part is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth part is Status Updates. Status Updates is an opportunity to report on what we've been up to. Take a couple minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week. And the fifth and final part is In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or be something you've identif identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. And that's how the meeting will go. With that, we'll get started with community news. Got One second, please. I'm going to have to reset. I'll go back through and fix the times on these as well. Um, the first up is the PyCalc Kickstarter campaign. PyCalc is a fully featured programmable Python calculator powered by an RP2040 with a color touchscreen, sound output, and micro microphone. The PyCalc includes an interactive MicroPython mode, which allows you to solve complex mathematical tasks and programming in Python without any delay. You can also control hardware components, including the I.O. ports, RGB LEDs, and the integrated speaker for sound output. Um, it's compatible with MicroPython or CircuitPython. And there's a link to it on Kickstarter. Next up, the project of the week in the newsletter was the Robot Picking Guitar. Via Make Magazine, Olav Martin Kavern, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, shares that he modified a Squire Telecaster guitar using a Pimeroni Servo 2040 digital servos, and CircuitPython to create a guitar-picking robot. He shares his design goals, tools, and how he overcame the power challenges to show how he plays with the guitar robot. And lastly, our very own Toddbot has created a new prototype board to use with CircuitPython's new SynthIO module. And included in the newsletter is a, a picture of the board as well. The CircuitPython weekly newsletter is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed on Monday mornings. The complete archives are available online and the link is in the notes document. It highlights the latest Python on hardware related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or projects, you can edit next week's draft on GitHub or submit a PR, or you can email cpnews at adafruit.com with your cool projects. Next up is the state of CircuitPython libraries and Blinka. Blinka. Um, this is a quantitative view overview of the entire project. It gives us a chance to look at the health of the project separate from our status updates. 
We'll talk about the project overall, then separately discuss the core, libraries, and Blinka. Overall, last week, we had 17 pull requests merged from 16 authors, which is great to see. Some names that were new to me are Data Noise TV, PIIT79, Leah Split KB, and Scientist. I hope I said all those right. We had nine reviewers, and we had 10 closed issues by eight people, and 13 op open by 12 people. And with that, Jeff, will you cover the core for us, please? Hello, yeah. Um... So in the core, which is the part of CircuitPython implemented um, in C, we had 14 pull requests merged by 13 authors, including a couple of those um, that you already mentioned, Data Noise TV, PIIT79, Leo Split KB, and Santos. And I'm guessing just as much as you on pronouncing those GitHub usernames. Uh, we also had six reviewers. So thanks to all those folks who are keeping things working smoothly in uh, the core world. We have 30 open pull requests. Um, a number of those are marked as draft and a number aren't. If you've got a pull request in progress and are waiting on something from the core contributors, please give us a ping on that pull request. And um, yeah, so issues wise, if things were fairly quiet, we had four closed issues by three people and nine open by eight people. Uh, because the release of 8.2 was fairly recent, we've got folks trying out new versions uh, and I guess finding some problems, which is no surprise. We've got 800, no, sorry, we've got 678 open issues, uh, but we usually organize them according to milestones, which uh, tell you what the Adafruit funded people are focusing on working on. Version 8.2.x has two open issues, and those are bugs or regressions that we want to fix. In an upcoming 8.2.1 release. Uh, for version 9, we've got 47 open issues, so there is a lot of stuff of all kinds that uh, we want to put into version 9. And then we've got some other um, milestones. A lot of the issues are marked long term, and what that means is Adafruit doesn't prioritize working on those issues right now, although in most cases we would be really thrilled to see somebody from the community step up and uh, implement a feature or uh, fix an issue that is listed as long-term. Um, yeah, so uh, speaking for Dan, who isn't here right now, um, he is talking about making an 8.2.1 release in the near future with a couple of small targeted bug fixes. And you can take a look uh, at those issues tagged 8.2.x to get an idea of what would be in that. And with that, um, that's what I have to tell you about the core. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. And I'll turn it over to Katni now to talk about the libraries. Thanks, Paul. This section applies to all of the CircuitPython libraries, which is everything uh, in the Adafruit CircuitPython library set, which is Adaf anything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore and the community bundle. Across all those repos, we had two pull requests merged by two authors and two reviewers. We have 60 open pull requests total. Um, we had six issues closed by five people and three opened by three people, leaving us with 634 open issues. 46 of those are labeled good first issue. In terms of library PyPI download stats this week, uh, over 311 libraries, we had 92,017 92, uh, PyPI downloads and the top 10 are listed in the notes if you're interested. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, we have one new library, Adafruit Circuit Python EK79686, and um, two updated libraries uh, as well. And that's where we are with the libraries. Thanks, Katni. Maker Melissa is out today, so I'll, read, I'll go through Blinka. Blinka is our Circuit Python compatibility layer for single board computers such as the Raspberry Pi. We had one pull request merged by one author, thanks, Foamy Guy, and one reviewer, Maker Melissa. We have three open pull requests, um, the newest being open 50 days and the, the oldest being 887 days. And we had zero closed issues by zero people and one open issue by one person. There are 99 current open issues and we had 10,992 PyPI downloads in the last week and 7,698 PyWheel downloads. And we support 119 boards. And that is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Next up is Hug Reports. 
Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start, and then we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. If you are text only or missing the meeting, I'll read your notes when I get to them in the list. So I'll start, and first up, Katni for all her help with the newsletter last week. Um, as well as Dan, I didn't know that Dan gives it a final once-over and a read-through every week and fixes any mistakes he catches. I'm happy to say he only caught one last week, so yay us. And a group hug. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dan. Oh, looks like Dan's still out. Um, Dan has one hug report for Tanud and Jepler for USB host work, which has been a long time coming. And DJ Devin3, you're up. Thank you. I have a hug for Skur. L. Pekinen and Whimsy for advice on how to decipher a display I.O. hex init sequence. Uh, Skur and Kevin T. for helping with converting parse JSON data into an array. And Jay Posada for writing an excellent uplot library for graphing data into all sorts of different types of graphs. Uh, and a hug to Anic Data for helping troubleshoot a display issue. That's it. Thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to Foamy Guy. All right, thanks, Paul. Uh, hug reports this week for me, thanks to uh, on GitHub Fast Eddie five one six, as well as Biffo Bear, who both submitted uh, several improvements to the Ethernet library recently. Uh, thank you to Michael Pokusa, who has submitted uh, some more improvements to documentation and a new set of functionality in the HTTP server library. Uh, and group hug for everybody. Thanks. Thanks, homie guy. Jepler, you're up next. Hi, uh, I wanted to give a hug back to a number of folks who offered supportive words on Mastodon about a family member's health situation, um, and a group hug. Thank you. Thank you. And Katni, it's your turn. All right, uh, first I've got hug reports uh, for you, Paul, for doing an amazing job with this week's newsletter, for all the help on last week's newsletter, for all the help on the upcoming issue, and basically thank you for all the help. Uh, to Dan for always doing the final proof on the newsletter, even while on vacation. To Tim for agreeing to help out with some uh, pull request shenanigans I need for screenshots for a guide update and suggesting a good issue topic to search through to find a library to update. Also to Tim for going through a quick CircuitPython library sweep, a few got missed along the way. To Tectric for submitting a few fixes to various infrastructure uh, situations we have going on, and a group hug. Thanks, Katni. I will read for Mark Gambler, who's missing the meeting today. He has a group hug to all as work and life have kept me from contributing much lately. Thanks, Mark. And Scott, you're up next. All right, thank you, Paul. Uh, first, a uh, hug report to everybody who's been flexible. <laughs> and Jeff is a perfect example of this while I'm out off and on taking care of Ari, who has an ear infection and just started daycare, so all of that. And then also a hug report to Katni and Paul for putting the newsletter together uh, while Anne is on vacation. Thanks, Scott. And I have a group hug from Te Tectric, who's not present today. And last is Tyeth, um, who has a hug for Hopcappy on Discord. The first user to knowingly test my SEN 5x driver and found an untested function had a bug. Related to Booleans and struct unpack, which, micro, which MicroPython doesn't support. Fixed and now ready to release the library. And that is Hug Reports. Next up, status updates. Status updates is our time to tell folks what we're up to individually. I'll start and we'll go through the list alphabetically. When I call on you, take a couple minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. This is also an opportunity to pro provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion becomes too long for status updates, we can move it to in the weeds. Uh, my status update for the week, is, has been mentioned, is just guest editing the, the Python on Hardware newsletters. I have so much more respect for Anne realizing how much work goes into it. Um, it's, uh, it's an amazing process. Um, it's our last week editing the newsletter before Anne gets back, so send us your projects and stories. We still need more. Um, we always need more. And with that, I'll read D Dan's updates. Um, Dan is making another pass over MicroPython merge to double check the choices. I'll annotate our code with CircuitPython markers of some kind so the origin of certain changes is clearer in the future, especially in places like the core interpreter. 
Looks like we'll do an 8.2.1 CircuitPython release soon to fix some regressions and maybe some easy bugs. And with that, DJ Devin 3 you're out. Oh, there we go. I wrote my first display driver. Adafruit has an FP7796 driver for Arduino, but not CircuitPython. I attempted to port the Arduino init sequence with no success, and instead used the ST7789 CircuitPython driver by Melissa as a basis. Figured out how to flip and invert the display hex init sequence using ST's data sheet to produce a working CircuitPython ST7796 driver. I made no claims that it's 100% correct. It's my first init sequence driver, um, and I will note that in the code. I intend to submit it, submit it to the community bundle when I figure out how to use cookie cutter. Uh, and I finished an Adafruit request Fitbit API example. Um, it will likely require a lot of documentation on how to use it with a microcontroller as it's not as straightforward as any other API because it requires some type of callback uh, server. Um, but you can do that manually from within a web browser. Uh, if you don't make a request to their server at least once every eight hours, you must generate a new token using their website or an HTTPS server of your own to capture the callback authorization code. Uh, and this is separate from the, the uplot stuff that I'm doing lately. Uh, that the, the Fitbit API example is like already wrapped up and ready to go kind of thing. So that's it. Thanks. And with that, I'll turn it over to Foamy Guy. All right. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, for the last couple of days, for me, I've had less CircuitPython activity than usual due to a storm on Friday afternoon that knocked out power for myself and loads of other people around town. Uh, late hug report for the uh, utility workers and response crews who have uh, done a great job getting folks back up and running. Uh, definitely very much appreciated to all of them. Um, I have been getting back into it today, working on CircuitPython stuff. I'm still working through uh, PR reviews and particularly uh, some of the older inactive PRs. So I'll say uh, again, if anybody does have uh, older inactive PRs or PRs that you think are waiting for someone to take a look, uh, feel free to ping me either on Discord or in GitHub and uh, that will kind of bump you to the top of my list as I'm working through them. A um, couple other things I have in the canon. Uh, for this week is kind of on the search outward from the ESP32 spy library. Uh, I did some changes in there, I think, last week or the week before <clears throat> to start switching over to settings.toml, uh, but I know there are going to be more places in other libraries and perhaps uh, project code that will uh, or that could be changed along with that in some places that may need to be. Um, and then uh, the other one is a sweep through the libraries to get some releases made for ones that had new commits since the last uh, release. Um, and that's what I have got going on for now. Thanks. Thank you. And Jeffler, it's your turn. Hi again. So uh, this morning, and I guess late on uh, Sunday, I was interacting on an issue and pull request about a microlab build problem. Uh, the person actually started on Discord and then was directed over and a uh, hug report to them for, for bringing this forward and then rapidly iterating with the issue and the pull request. I don't have their name right off the top of my tongue. Uh, anyway, so there's been a bug in GCC for a really long time. If you use FP classify, which is a C function, and you have a certain level of optimization enabled and like two other details, you get a spurious warning. And that warning may be treated as a compile error depending on circumstances. Um, but they offered a workaround and after kind of digging into it, I'm like, this workaround is fine. It's going to, it's going to work correctly and it's not going to encounter this diagnostic. So that's great. Um, and so I think we'll move forward in Microlab with that, uh, fix. Um, I also moved the USB host keyboard map feature forward. Scott had one item in the review, which is, could you please move this to a module where it makes sense instead of one where it doesn't make sense. Um, so thanks for that review, Scott. Uh, the other thing I've been working on is SDIO for the RP2040 microcontroller. I just finished removing the last not implemented, so tomorrow, or if I get back to working after the meeting today, I can start testing that on hardware. Uh, the capacity check is also still missing. It returns a bogus value instead of raising not implemented. 
and um, that's something that I'll have to figure out. It looks like the the uh, SDIO implementation doesn't have a specific return the capacity API in it. It's probably not super tricky, but just something that I need to implement because it's not there yet. Uh, yeah, so coming out, coming up, I will be out on Friday as well as next Monday, so I'll miss the meeting. Uh, my focus is on SDIO. Hopefully it will start working quickly, but if it doesn't work by the end of day Tuesday, I may put it aside for a little while if I'm kind of like, oh, this doesn't work at all and I have no idea, but we'll see when we get there. Um, and then another thing that I want to work on, Toddbot has a seemingly simple but actually tricky to implement request to get information about a playing notes envelope state, and I may take a look at implementing that. And um, yeah, there will be plenty more got uh, a lot of stuff kind of at the more than one week out level but uh, yeah that'll keep me busy for this week thanks jeffler with that i'll turn it over to katney wrong button all right so last week i worked on guide feedback and the newsletter um i think i might have had a couple guides published i don't remember at this point um this week i'll be working on guide feedback and the newsletter um FYI, I'm around for a couple hours on Thursday for the newsletter and then Friday to get the newsletter published, but otherwise I'm out, quote unquote, those two days. Um, so I won't be doing anything but newsletter stuff on Thursday and Friday. Uh, so if you need anything from me, um, please get it by Wednesday. That's all I've got. Thanks. Yay, newsletter. With that, I'll turn it over to Scott. Thanks, Paul. Um, so Ari, my son, has his first ear infection, so he's to today at least. Uh, we'll see how he feels tomorrow and the rest of the week. Um, so that means that I'll be out off and on and trading with Becca, my wife, slash partner. Um, what I was working on last week was I, I almost, I'm almost done with a PR, making a PR for the USB host port singleton. This handles like how you manage like uh, the fact that once you start it, it keeps going. Um, it works on the RP2040, but I'm still running down a nasty bug on the IMX where registers seem to be changed slash loaded incorrectly, which is just, and it depends on like all sorts of stuff. Uh, it's really weird. I'm going to try uh, putting that function in RAM and see if that fixes things. Uh, regardless of whether it does, I'll make a PR because the, this issue I've seen uh, before as well. Um, I made a PR and I haven't looked to see if it was merged to fix the RP2040's double click to reset for safe mode. In the Pico DVI stuff that I did, I changed it to use a scratch register in the watchdog, which turns out to be reset when you press the reset button. <laughs> so it didn't actually work. Uh, instead, we could put a value in memory, and, and as long as that me memory value doesn't get overwritten, it works. Um, so that seemed to work better. Uh, I also made a PR to tiny USB to fix an issue where um, the kind of port level setting for memory alignment for the USB buffers uh, isn't used by default for the host buffers, um, which means that um, it kind of makes it work correctly for device but not for host on the IMX. So uh, I have that pull request out, and uh, that will hopefully make USB host on IMX better as well. It, the issue was is that it was set to four bytes, uh, four byte alignment, and um, there's a couple ways to manage the cache. One is invalidate, which says, I don't care what's in my cache, I just don't want it anymore. And then there's clean, which is like, the things that are in the cache get written back to RAM. Um, so what was happening is that we were saying like this four byte aligned thing, we said invalidate it, and then we were inadvertently basically dropping the changes we'd made to variables that live in memory near that, because it's 32 bytes that get invalidated. Anyway, so I have a, a fix for that. Um, one thing that I'm curious to hear from folks about, so maybe we could talk a little bit in the weeds, is I was playing around with switching CircuitPython 9 to uh, a new font. Um, there's either Unifont or Kazet. Um, Unifont is, by the GNU project, it's 8 by 16, so it's a little bit bigger, but it has really, really good Unicode coverage. So um, it'd be cool because we could then support like Korean and Japanese and, and other languages. Uh, builds, and they also have emojis, which was kind of neat. Um, the other font is Kazette, which uh, Jeff found. It's 5x13, which is a kind of a weird size. Ideally, it'd be like 6x12. I think it's 5x13. It might be 6x13, actually. 
Um, mostly, I found that like the the number four and the letter Q are one more pixel wider than most, and the emojis are li wider as well. Um, so it's kind of annoying. Um, but I'm curious what people think about switching fonts and and uh, potentially getting more support. Uh, one thing that would come with this, and that I would have to do, is supporting half width characters and full width characters. Um, so like six wide and twelve wide, um, for example, as well. So. Uh, maybe we'll touch on that a little bit. Uh, and then lastly, uh, Lamore made the toy uh, hacker board. Um, and I got a copy, or I got a prototype of that, and I want to put it in the toy. Um, so I'll, one, what will come with that is she had some feedback on the web workflow, so we'll do some polish there as well. And that's it for me. Thanks, Scott. I will read for Tech Trick, who's not present today. He is on break from grad school for this half of the summer. Last week, started a few pull requests to allow the CI to print out the versions used by pre-commit, which should help in specific cases where the information is needed for debugging CI issues. Submitting a couple pull requests that would enable certain bundles to be skipped from being built. For example, CircuitPython underscore typing doesn't need an MPY bundle, so building it and attaching it to releases can be skipped. And worked on a couple PR reviews. This week and upcoming, looking into fixing and improving the CI for the Learn Guide repository with the goal of allowing the CI to only check updated guides when triggered via PR. Relooking at using RP2040 JS for CI purposes. I've been keeping the repos I started up to date and I'm hoping to come up with a proposal. And that was Tectric. Uh, next up is Feed2, who's mm -hmm. chat only today. Last week, I built a RISC V lab for submission as an official RISC V org lab. This means that anyone who needs to compile a test on RISC-5 64 hardware, they can contact me and I can set them up with dedicated hardware for, for running things like a GitHub remote runner. So it's useful for running actions. I have also started compiling and testing Python 3 modules. Feel free to contact me in Discord if you think you'll need hardware, or if you think there's a Python module that you want me to work on. This week and upcoming, I'll build a CircuitPython keyboard, KMK, with native Costa Rican languages like I apologize, I'm going to, uh, I don't speak Spanish um, or Costa Rican, but Bribri and Kevacar, which need special characters to write them. So again, my apology for mangling those words. And that was status updates. Next up is In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for long form discussion that either come out of status updates or that folks have identified ahead of time. If you have any in the weeds topics, please make sure they get added while we're discussing other things so we're not waiting around to see if anyone has topics. Um, Scott, I'll turn it over to you. You had, you had mentioned maybe um, having a font discussion going in the weeds. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm just curious, do people want to talk fonts? Um, I just linked in the chat to my prototype branch. There were some changes that, were, that I needed to make to, to prototype it. Um, so take a look at that, and if you're curious and want to try it, uh, let me know. I'm happy to get it going or, or get you some builds uh, for testing that as well. I think I showed it on Show and Tell as well. I, I, I was distracted. Did you talk about the licensing of the Unicorn one? I didn't, but it's dual licensed is my understanding. So it's not... It's, does it, 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 it infectious? That's what I'm worried about. Yeah. I don't believe so because even the the answer is yes. The the GNU font embedding exception and the SIL OFL uh, open font license allow for that. Okay. Good. Require derivative fonts that others create to be released to the public under the same licensing terms not to prohibit the use of those fonts with certain software uh, under the commercial use uh, part here on their page. Um, the tricky thing that I was running into with the Unifont is that they, they provide two different font files, like for plane zero and plane one and all the emojis in plane one. Um, so I was having trouble like kind of wrangling that into one single BDF file. So you'll see in my branch, I actually just like had it load from two different BDFs instead, which is kind of annoying, but I did get it. I got it working to the point where we could see it. It just didn't, um, I wasn't doing the half-width, full-width thing. So that would be the required 
that would be part of the stuff that we had to do to switch. And then the other thing that we would have to do is we likely will, because the font's slightly larger, and we'd be supporting languages we currently have it turned off, um, we're probably going to have to adjust, uh, like, the flash the flash footprints for, for things. And, and maybe we want to think about changing the flash footprint for different font sizes or different uh, languages. It might give us more breathing room that way as well. Uh, but it makes it impossible or, or not nice to switch between languages then. Um, but yeah. Yeah, um, DJ Devin says... Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, with the uh, stuff that I'm doing for the editor, um, it would be nice to have a cursor. I, I think, you know, if, if we are going to support half and full width characters, that's also already like a big break from how time grid yeah. works. And so it may be a time to think about whether there's like a next generation terminal thing that is not a tile grid, but is more based on drawing the pixels into a bitmap, or I'm not sure how that would work. Um, but to support at least a cursor to maybe support um, foreground or background colors of text, um, I don't I don't know how that would work. Yeah, Did you might tackle. Uh, do, isn't tile grid limited to like a sixteen bit tile number, or is that a mistaken memory of? Me? I think it might be eight bit. Oh boy! All right. So I think that 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 could be one problem. Yeah, uh, for sure. Because my plan with the full width and half width was just to basically make the full width characters two tiles, and then Terminal would know which font, which glyphs were two tiles instead of one. Oh boy. Um, All right. It's yeah, I mean, not I see that could work. Yeah, but it gets it, it gets it's a lot more metadata because you can't just count how many characters in you are and then take that as the tile index. Kind of like you have to add them together as you do it. I don't know, I like I wanted to play around with it, but it's not something that I'm like insisting on doing. Um But I really I like for the for the standalone circuit python I like the idea of doing like the emoji emoji stuff too. It also crossed my mind to try to come up with a way to do it with the font stuff on the on the um like on the file system rather than in, in uh, Circuit Python at all. Yeah, um, it turns out that right now it's not possible to use um, a different font. The, the a different yeah, you can't create the right kind of font object within Circuit Python code. You can only use the one that's coded into ROM for using within a tile grid and um, terminal I/O. Yeah. It it would be neat to lift that limitation as well. Yeah, if you could use a different modus. And maybe that's the right way to do it. It's like, we don't support that stuff by default, but we actually document how to use Terminal I.O. yourself with a different font in case you do want other characters and stuff. That's, that might be the better way to do it, because maybe then you can also do, like, six color... You could have more colors in your font or something. I don't know how fonts handle colors, but like for colored emoji or things. Uh, I don't know, not super high priority, but something I I, I I like the idea, especially if we're moving to a workflow, a standalone workflow, it'd be cool to support all of the languages that we currently have. Uh, so that you could do it there. All right, well, that's what's on my mind, so I'll let you get back to DJ Devon. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think for cursor, Jeff, we had talked about like cursor could be just a single tile grid that you move on top of it uh, instead of requiring like the the grid of tile grids to, the the grid tile grid or whatever the scroll area to actually do it. Um, it did also cross my mind that if we moved to a snake emoji instead of the blinka the colored blinka, um, it would be monochrome again, and we could actually. Like, because it's a palette, we can make that palette mutable, and you'd actually be able to make, like, a green on black or green on other green sort of look, um, which I thought would be kind of funny <laughs> um, for the circuit Python terminal. Yeah, 
Uh, DJ Devin says, if a language isn't supported by terminal IO by default, I can see how it could be a big problem for a certain language. Yeah. And we uh, will turn, we actually turn terminal IO off for different, um, for different languages. So it's not on on all languages. And we will have a problem where when we turn it on for things, we'll fill up our builds and we'll have to figure out how to manage that. Uh, but yeah, we could totally do blue on other blue. <laughs> I was thinking, yeah, that that's an easy change we could do. Like, just make the like. There's some palette internally that we use for for those tile grids. It wouldn't be too hard to just make it mutable so that you could set the two colors. Uh, so yeah, we'll think we'll keep thinking about it. It's not a type a high priority, but we'd love to. If if folks are able to find, I think ideally what we would have is we would have a. 6 by 12 font that, uh, that had uh, 12 by 12 full width characters. Um, so the emoji would be 12 by 12 and, and the all of the uh, CJK sort of characters would be that too, but I'm skeptical. I don't know if that's actually possible because um, I know like the Unifont is, is 16 by 16. Um, so if anybody runs across something, let me know. I think that's it, Paul. All right. Thanks, Scott. Uh, that's all for In the Weeds. Thanks, everyone. With that, I'm going to wrap up. This has been the CircuitPython Weekly Meeting for July 17th, 2023. Thank you to everyone who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held next Monday as usual at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. The meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to adafruit.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the Circuit Pythonistas role on Discord. We hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everyone.